Hello, hello, my friends. This is Dr. David Snyder, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Unlimited Influence Change Your Mind, Change Your Life podcast. Um, many of you know that I have spent my life finding ways and, and pioneering ways to help hypnotists and neurolinguistic programmers, coaches, and, and other people who are in the helping profession uh, find more opportunities to uplift their skills, make more money, enjoy higher quality of life, and most importantly, reach more people. Um, during my studies, I discovered and I came across a gentleman who is the absolute master of a, an area that for a large percentage of us in the hypnosis and coaching world is an area where an elite few are making a tremendously good living, helping and uplifting people, and almost nobody knows about it. The gentleman we're about to, to talk to is, I, I make a joke, I call him the grand poobah of the corporate hypnosis world. Um, corporate hip speaking is one of the places where you as a hypnotist, a coach, a neurolinguistic programmer can truly up-level every aspect of your life and your business. But for the most part, nobody is teaching you how to break that invisible barrier. Most people didn't even know that this was something that was a, an incredibly viable hypnosis income stream. So uh, my guest for today is uh, Mr. Anthony Gailey. And for those of you, um, he runs a program called the Corporate Hypnosis Masterclass. He focuses mostly uh, up until recently on teaching hypnotists how to break into the realm of corporate speaking, which is an amazingly powerful way to leverage all of your other uh, talents and skills. It allows you to bring in more clients. It can allow you to expand your authority, to reach more people, and to really, really upgrade um, your income streams. So a little bit about Mr. Anthony Gailey. Anthony Gailey is an internationally known therapist, um, psychotherapist, and author. He's a business trainer and keynote speaker with over 30 years of experience presenting to many of the world's top organizations. He's literally given thousands of speeches to Fortune 500 audiences, major associations like Walmart and Ford and Southern Bell and Sprint and Pfizer and Comcast, FedEx. And I could go on, right? He's presented in Rome, Paris, Cairo. Istanbul. Would you guys like to travel the world? This might be a really cool all expenses paid way to do this, right? He's, he's taught all over the world. He's been one of rec America's most recognized, um, let, me, let me rephrase that. He's recognized as one of America's 30 hottest speakers and was selected to speak for the prestigious million dollar round table, an honor given to less than 1% of, uh, of speakers on four different occasions. This man is a treasure trove of information about a, a way to really upgrade and, and level up your practice that almost nobody knows about. And it is my great pleasure and honor to share with you the grand poobah of <laughs> speaking, Mr. Anthony Gailey. Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> pleasure. My pleasure. I didn't know I was a poobah. <laughs> <laughs> You're my poobah. <laughs> so, so your you. your whole thing, you've been a corporate speaker like since Noah's forty two years. <laughs> forty two years. Yeah. So has it changed a lot? In, in yeah, your... it evolves. Yeah, it, it evolves with the topics of the time. Uh, I began in nineteen eighty, and the topic in the time was computers. Oh. You know, Apple had come out in sixty seven or something, and IBM was going to build their uh, desktop and. Everybody was going to get a desktop computer. So the talks in those days centered around how computing was going to change the business world. And then uh, I guess in the mid 80s, it was all these mergers. You had this merger mania going on. And the keyword was synergy in the business world. So everything was talking about synergy. And then you had dot com, in the first part in the middle part of the 90s. Then you had the crash in 2007. And everything's about how to handle the crash. And then, uh, yeah. It, it, about once every five years, you modify what you're talking about to meet the times. Okay. So we talk about becoming a corporate hypnotist or a corporate hypnotic speaker. What are we really talking about? We're obviously not talking necessarily about stage hypnosis or entertainment, are we? Uh, you know, yes and no. I, I think what I do with the hypnotic demonstration is no different than 
an average stage hypnotist in many respects. But what I did it that made it unique was I tied everything to business to a business message instead of just demonstrating a hypnotic phenomenon. I would say, well, this is something similar to what you might be experiencing in your personal or your business life. And then all of a sudden they took it seriously. Oh. So if you tell someone they're stuck to the chair, that's a you know, common hypnotic stunt, so to speak. And uh, people would laugh at it in a comedy show. But if you say that being stuck to the chair is no different than being stuck in your business or being stuck about asking somebody for referrals, now you've suddenly made it a business message. Oh, very powerful. Very powerful. Yeah. I could I could see that I, I, the analogy is really, I mean, literally being stuck in a chair. I can see how people think, oh, wow. Right. Because we, we we learn through analogy and metaphor. So I think that that's an amazingly cool analogy. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about um, how to do hypnosis. Are we going to talk about um you know, what's, you know, what's the next Teletubby movie? I don't know, but, you know, so, <laughs> uh, obviously we want to talk about the, uh, um, an income stream and a, and a, either a, a side hustle or a, a primary income stream, a uh, career choice or change um, as a corporate speaker and, and using hypnosis as, um, as a means to deliver those messages or a tool to deliver those messages. So I'm curious, and I'm, I'm asking on, 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 sure. on behalf of my audience as well. Um, why, why would somebody actually want to be a corporate hypnosis speaker or a corporate hypnotist? I don't know. I don't know what the technical term would be, but you know, why, why do we want to do this? A ton of reasons. Uh, first of all, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get picked up by limousines or if you're introduced as the keynote or if you're sitting at the head table, you get uh, a lot of respect that mm -hmm. you sometimes maybe don't deserve, right. but as you're, you're much more authoritative and authoritarian in your presentation and uh, just respect it a lot more. Uh, in my particular case, one of the things that appealed to me was that I reached far more people than I ever reached as a hypnotherapist or even as a stage hypnotist. The numbers sometimes are 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 8,000 people in an audience. Uh, and so the message that I was delivering was able to be delivered at a far greater rate as you say, if you're selling product at the back of the room, and most speakers do, the amount of product you sell goes up exponentially depending on the size of the group. Mm -hmm. uh, it was lots of future business. If you get one gig at an insurance company at one of their branches, for example, Prudential Insurance or New York Life or something like that, they have some of them 100 offices around the country, and that's potentially 100 more speeches. So it's... Uh, just an awesome way of relatively easily networking yourself out, getting your message across to a lot more people. Uh, it's great lifestyle. If you uh, like travel, as you say, I've been to dozens of countries. I go back to Istanbul again next month for the sixth time. Wow. You get to see yeah, a lot of different countries and a lot of different um, interesting experiences. Having your presentation being translated as you speak is always a fascinating experience. You say something that might be funny, 30 seconds later, the audience laughs when you're talking about something serious and you <laughs> it takes a minute for you to, you know, put that together in your mind. A lot of reasons. I just love it. You know, it's, yeah. it's outstanding. It reminds me of, you know, um, I, I've done a couple of corporate speaking gigs. I want to do more. Um, but I remember one time I was hired by Essence Security um, to, uh, to do some talks in Israel. And uh, I remember the the language the the language bear. They did they spoke they spoke good English, but I tell you the Israeli people that was one of the toughest audiences I'd ever dealt with um, because they would come in and and every day it was like a battle to get because they they're very they're very unified right so they would they would all come in and they would sit at the, like I have I had five rows of chairs they sit in the last three rows and I'd ask them to move to the front of the room and they'd look at me and go no. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> nothing i would say nothing no no amount of pleading would get them to move as a unit so i like I, one day i just looked down and i said look you guys realize that i always call the people in the back of the room they got up as a unit and walked the, <laughs> the next day they come in and uh they're all in the back of the room again and now so you guys know i'm going to call people like we're not fooled by you this time so i, <laughs> so I had all my assistants take the first two rows out. So now they were just stuck. It was just, it's, they're amazingly cool people, but they are some of the toughest audience oh. ever. So, and, and in line with that, I'm curious, you know, when we talk about language barriers and cultures and, and, and stuff like that, is, is there a lot, 
and if I guess we're maybe jumping a little bit ahead, but when you do trainings like this in other countries, mm-hmm. how, you know, what percentage would you say of, 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 you know, other country work versus in country work? Um, does it, does it fall to what? Percentage? Oh, as much as you want. In other words, I obviously, because I didn't want to be spending all my life in an airplane, mm-hmm. I would do most of my work here in the country. But if I chose to, uh, you know, if you're working with bureaus and all, you just tell them I, I prefer, you know, offshore bookings. You end up spending a day getting there, do your presentation, another day getting back. So your minimum talking about three days out of production to to do the presentation. Sure. Uh, one group sent me on a 10 day cruise. You started in Venice and went all through the Mediterranean and all like eight different countries. And that was 10 days to give a 60 minute speech. Wow. And I did it to take the Mediterranean cruise. But you know, <laughs> Well, so the down yeah. <laughs> and the Canary Islands was a day to get out there and a day back, that kind of stuff. But uh, as much as you want, actually, I think from a financial point of view, you would do more within the country that you live simply because there were times, many times I'd be doing four and five a week. Mm-hmm. You know, where you would wake up and not know which city you were in and right. have to look at, look at your saying? notes. Go ahead. Sorry. To, to relate to what the company is and what your topic, you know, what, what your, your uh, choice of words is going to be. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think you you do can do it whatever you want. Okay. Specialize in overseas if you want. Sure. So I've, I've done a lot of overseas training as an excuse to take a vacation, all all expenses. <laughs> so I'm sure I, I'm assuming that those those out of country trips, the 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 company that hired you covered the the entire the entire path. everything. Yeah, everything. And one of the stipulations of going overseas is uh, business class as minimum travel. Right. So okay. you're not cramped in the seats and whatever. Okay. So I'm curious, um, you know, is, is, is being a corporate hypnotist, is, is it difficult to, to uh, cause I, you know, I can count on one hand, the amount of people I know doing this kind of work. And it would seem like a no brainer to me that, um, if, if there was such a, a, a big niche, why aren't more people doing this? Why, why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, the only answer I have is that they just don't know about it. Mm. Uh, it's, it's what, you know, this course that I do, the Corporate Hypnotist Masterclass. I think I mentioned in your previous interview, a friend of mine, James Mapes. Mm-hmm. There, there were three people that I was aware of when I was doing all the talks uh, that did corporate hypnosis. I mean, real corporate hypnosis where they're doing a serious talk and they had a hypnosis demonstration as opposed to just doing an entertainment show after dinner, you know, as a as a comedy thing. And uh, he and I were talking one night and we started watching videos on YouTube. And we noticed that some of the hypnotists that we saw, stage hypnotist videos, I thought were really quite good. I thought they had great stage presence and you know, very loquacious and very articulate. And we looked at each other. Why is that person doing that for that small group? Mm-hmm. They should, you know, they, they could be doing what we were doing. Why aren't they doing it? And our conclusion was they just don't know. That's right. what's that's what started the course. Right. So, did, so I'm curious, you know, everybody wants to know about you and and obviously there's there's obviously a a tremendous opportunity behind what you do but did god just reach down one day and anoint you on the forehead and say you will be the grand poobah of corporate hypnosis how did how did you (laughs) how did you discover this and and you know what's your origin story so to speak oh i was i did just the the opposite of being anointed i just did a very (laughs) stupid thing (laughs) i had a successful practice in fort lauderdale florida and I uh, fell in love. This woman wanted to move to Hawaii. So I packed, you know, sold the practice, took the money from that, packed everything I had in about six or seven boxes and moved out to Hawaii, not knowing anything about Hawaii. Uh, very expensive. Couldn't find a house that I could afford. You know, the cheapest one was like five hundred thousand dollars. This was 1980 mm-hmm. and uh, ended up in a uh, place outside of Hilo, Hawaii. So I figured, fine, I'll do my hypnotherapy in Hilo. No. It's 60% Japanese. There were only 68, 69,000 people max. Mm-hmm. It just was not enough people to, to do it. And uh, it was actually her suggestion, you know, you ought to start public speaking for groups because I had done public speaking to build the hypnotherapy practice. I had done some uh, work in front of uh, Lions Clubs, Rotaries, uh, condominium clubs, etc., I had put some um, notices in newspapers that uh, I would do a free presentation for any nonprofit organization, and I would use that to drum up business in the hypnotherapy. 
And she said, you should monetize it. So I started calling companies in Hawaii, in Honolulu. I was living on the big island and told them that I do a presentation and they brought me in and that's how it started. Uh, yeah, I didn't know what I was doing at first, but it didn't take long to figure it out. I so made every mistake you could make, but... Did you have like a mentor or did you just have to, you know, trip over your own tongue, so to speak? Tripped over my own tongue. Uh, <laughs> yeah, tripped over my own tongue. Didn't know what I was doing. Did everything backwards. Everything backwards. Uh, when I first showed up uh, doing these presentations, I, I was not dressed properly. Uh, I was initially selling tickets to an all day program. Mm -hmm. I would go into a sales meeting, you know, give me 20 minutes in front of your sales meeting tell them that I've got this all day program coming up and it's X number of dollars and here's where it is. And I'd say, who's going? And the hands, well, I'll see you there. And I'd walk out without even getting an enrollment. I mean, that's, that's how dumb I was. Right. And finally, someone pointed out, so let me get this straight. You're having this seminar. You're going to show up. You have no idea how many people are going to walk through that door. And I said, no. And he said, well, that's crazy. And why is that crazy? So you should be asking for the money up front. Oh, I don't know. You know, and you should be dressing. You're dressing more, you know, to appeal to business people. Oh, I, I guess you should cut the hair. You know, I have my hair done. <laughs> you know, one by one, I worked out. I mean, it was horrible. I was, I did not know anything. Had no mentor. As far as I knew, no one had ever done it before. Uh, and just, it, it, you know, I loved doing it. Mm -hmm. So I handled any rejection I got. I handled any obstacles. Mm -hmm. But uh, once you smooth out the wrinkles, it was... It was wonderful. Excellent. So would it would it be safe to say, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but before you came along, there was really there, this this particular niche didn't even necessarily exist other than for people who are doing other types of corporate speaking. But you literally figured out the system to become super successful because you've been doing it 42 years. Yeah. You know, you don't do something for 42 years unless you you, you figured something out. Right. When I was uh very, very, very busy. You know, I've, I've stepped back from because of my age, but when I was really busy, uh, people would come up and say, who's your competition? Who, I, I don't know. And uh, I heard two names over the years. And one was James Mapes. Uh, James had a program, uh, but his focus was imagination and he did a hypnosis demonstration. And then, um, can't believe I can't remember, Gil Eagles. He did a mentalist thing with mm -hmm. a slash hypnosis, but neither of them was really giving a, uh, kind of what I was doing, a content driven. Mm -hmm. I was showing people in business how to improve productivity, how to get focused on their goals and stay focused. But as far as I know, at corporate level, there were three of us and I never even met them until I met James about six years ago. Still never met Gil Eagles. So wow. that was it. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Sorry. Let me interrupt you. I had the field to myself. So that's... So that's is there... Obviously, there's a few more people doing this, but would, would you say it's still like the Wild West? Is it wide yes. open? It, yeah, wide open. Uh, one thing that I learned that amazed me is how many people have conventions and, and, and meetings. It's an unbelievable number of, of uh, conferences, conventions, regional meetings, corporate meetings, local meetings. It's just it's almost limitless. Mm -hmm. I would say easily hundreds of thousands of meetings. And so, you know, I mean, how many people are out there with a positive attitude message? There's probably a thousand speakers that talk about positive attitude or uh, the power of um, attraction. Mm -hmm. Probably a hundred speakers talk about that and they're, they're all booked up. Yeah. It's, it's a limitless number of groups just within a major metropolitan area. If you live close to a city, you'll see how many real estate offices there are, insurance offices, people, sales groups, et cetera. Those all have meetings and they all bring in speakers. It's huge. Okay. And w would you say that the a person with, again, you have a PhD and all these other things. Would you say that a person with the basic training in hypnosis could, could do this or, or would they need some kind of specialized extra? You know, no, I don't think you and I were talking about this uh, earlier. I, I think my hypnosis demonstration is at best average. Mm -hmm. There are a few things in there that are unique, but I know there are many stage hypnotists that I think are much more skilled than I am in hypnotizing people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I keep it corporate and I keep it very tame and I keep it obviously very non-controversial, et cetera. But I don't think as a hypnotist, there's anything special about me per se. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's the way I packaged it. It was right. taking the hypnosis and connecting it to business that made it palatable and made it different. So I do not think you need to be the world's greatest hypnotist to, to do what I do. Yeah. And I don't th even think you need to be a great speaker because I've heard a number of speakers that in my mind are not great speakers at all, but they have a good message or they are uh, a compelling story or they are enthusiastic about what they're doing, I think that carries more weight than being eloquent or loquacious or you know perfectly quaffed. I don't think that's necessary as much as having something you really believe in. So you're, again, not to put words in your mouth. So in other words, you, you don't have to be a superstar at hypnosis, right? You don't have to be a Scott Sandman or a, you know, a, God forbid, a David Snyder or a, a <laughs> to, to, to do this well. And you don't even have to be a great speaker and you can be actually reaching more people and, and, and in, a, in a niche where there's almost no competition. Right. Exactly. Okay. That's, that's pretty cool. And while we're on the line, again, because what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to kind of play the, the part of my audience, if, and okay. if I can be so arrogant. And so I'm always trying to, I'm thinking in my head, what, what would keep people from wanting to do this? Like when, you know, why, you know, if you had these skills and you had these aspirations, why, what beliefs might people have about this niche that might keep them from taking action? And, and, and why are those beliefs, you know, either ill thought or, or, you know, not even accurate? There are two things, mm -hmm. probably three things. I think to keep them first is they can't, they can't, or they don't see themselves doing it. Okay. Uh, I was doing these presentations in Honolulu for a number of years. And mm -hmm. I was selling these things for these all for this all day program and making maybe two or $3,000 per seminar. Mm -hmm. I did enough of them that it caught the attention of a speaker bureau. And a guy from a speaker bureau came up to me after one of my presentations. Well, you know, wow, your material is really good and really interesting. Do you have an agent? No. Uh, what are you charging? You know, I said, well, you know, about 1500 to 2000. He said, well, I can get you some bookings, but the first thing we're going to do is it's going to be 5,000. And I tried to talk him out of it. I said, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And I really, you know, these people, I just don't think the companies have that much money, but I'm going to go on. And he stopped me and he said, Tony, he said, you'll be a $5,000 speaker the minute you can see yourself as a $5,000 speaker. And I remember thinking to myself, where have I heard that before? <laughs> That's <laughs> I was like, Duh. And so he said, this is the way it works. We price you at 5,000 and you know, I'm fairly confident I can get you some bookings. The other thing he said to me is, why are you just doing these small groups? He said, you really should be doing bigger groups. Well, uh, how do you do that? He goes, well, you know, I'll show you. You know, that's how we do Because I was, I was keeping myself limited within real estate and insurance. He said, why wouldn't Microsoft want speakers? Doesn't GE want speakers? Yeah, why, why aren't you marketing to them? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So he said, well, okay, we're going to put you out there at 5,000. He says, let me tell you how it works. If they bite, if we get your bookings, we're going to go to 6,500. Then we're going to go to seven. Then the 7,500, we're going to go to eight. We'll go until they stop paying. And then we'll go back to the last number. If we get you to 10,000 and then we ask 12 and nobody books, we'll go back to 10. And it's all an illusion. Really? He happened, yeah, he happened to be, uh, he and his brother were the founders of one of the very first speaker bureaus out in Beverly Hills, California. And uh, the guy was actually O.J. Simpson's babysitter is how wow. his bureau did. Yes. When O.J. was uh, his first wife and he had his two African-American children, uh, he was the babysitter for those kids. And O.J. took him under his wing, you know, let him, he said O.J.'s house was a constant circle of celebrities and all and he said one night a bunch of football players were sitting around talking about you know the past and all and i think he said it was mercury mars said something to the effect that you know general foods called me and they want me to come and speak at their convention what are you going to talk about the super bowl what else you know you know they're going to give me 500 hours to come out there and speak you know and mark said bing because <laughs> here i am knowing all these people so i said i went to oj can i connect with your friends and so they started a bureau called All Stars Speaker Bureau. And he goes, I remember running around high-fiving when we would get a $500 booking. And he said, recently, this told me the story 10 years ago. 
He said the guy who was coaching the Lakers was offered by Bank of America 10 talks at $75,000 each. Wow. And he turned them down because he was too busy. He goes, you know, because the price just goes up and up and up and up and up and up until, until they stop paying it. And he says it's all an illusion. So in this current atmosphere that we're in, if you're not asking at least $5,000, you are not a serious player. Some so, people will say, I'll, I'll ask 2500 If anybody else is doing $5,000, i will ask 2500 and I'll get more bookings. That's not the way it works. Business is almost almost backwards. If if you have two speakers of equal ability and one's asking five and the other's asking 10, the guy asking 10 will probably get more bookings. Wow. So, and we, talked, yeah, we actually talked about this a little bit in our other interview, yeah. uh, that 5000 is kind of like the magic number. Like nobody... Nobody in in that biz, and I don't think it's it's I don't think it's it's it's, it's true just for corporate speaking. I think in any form of professional speaking, the five five thousand dollars seems to be like the serious professional number. The floor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. So you asked me what's keeping people from doing it, mm -hmm. and I think I, I do think one of the biggest is they can't see it happening. Right. But if you if they would put a speech together and ask five thousand without blinking. Mm -hmm. And they say, what's your fee? 5,000 plus expenses, period. Don't say, but, or since you're local, or if you do more than one, it's $5,000 plus expenses. And don't say another word because the first person that speaks after that loses. Gotcha. And, the, and the first time they get a yes and they go out there, well, wow, it doesn't take them any more than two times before I'm a $5,000 speaker. <laughs> So they, sure. they go. So the, the biggest hurdle to overcome is getting them to ask for the proper amount to stop underpricing themselves. And then, as I just pointed out, go to six, go to seven, go to eight, go ahead until people stop saying yes. Then you'll know what you're what you're worth to the market that day. Uh, and the second thing that keeps them from asking uh, is fear. They don't know what to say. They've never said it before. When I first doing the did the programs and did follow ups. How you do, love the program? How you doing? Are you going to do it yet? Well, have you made phone calls or made contacts yet? Not yet. Well, why not? Well, I don't know quite what to say. Well, didn't we go over that in the course? Yeah, but I'm not sure I would say it right or how to do it. So you've got the workbook. I printed them and gave them scripts. <laughs> you know, here's what you so say. So literally, you, you give them a word, word for word scripts to use like on the phone and through emails and, and stuff like that to, yeah. to get them through that hurdle. That's the other thing. They, they don't know what to say or how to present themselves. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, that's the second thing that holds them back. And the third thing that holds them back is they're afraid to let go of what they already have, which is which is actually quite common. You know, I've got a hypnotherapy business, or I've got a stage hypnosis business, and it's doing so-so, but at least it's doing so-so. If I kind of move into this, uh, I might fail. Mm -hmm. so. But so, I think those are the three things that hold people back. Okay. So here's a, a, a devil's advocate question. So, okay. All right. So uh, I can see myself as a $5,000 speaker. I know what to, you know, I, I may not know how to approach corporations, but I have, you know, I have this talk prepared and I have a message that I want to say, why can't I just walk up to like a speaker bureau and say, Hey, put me out there. Cause that's not how speaker bureaus work. Oh. They, they're not there to make you famous or profitable or successful mm -hmm. they are attracted to people who are famous or profitable or successful in other words i've been doing it for a couple of years and i got relatively well known within the insurance industry and a lot of the insurance companies were calling their speaker bureau saying we're having a regional conference or we're having an annual conference and uh, well, who we want to do this is tony gailey and they'd say who's tony gailey it's called buzz Mm -hmm. Who's Tony Gailey? You know? And they kept hearing my name. And so this one guy tracked me down. Who are you? You know, and I was a unknown. I was working in the wilderness at that time. And he was like, well, why aren't you booking yourself here? When that opened the door for me. But you have to have buzz because everybody's sending tapes and videos and stuff to the speaker bureau. So you have to create buzz. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. Yeah. And one of the simplest ways, you know, start sending them any clippings you have, send your demo tape, try to get a personal relationship, call the bureau and say, I'm going to be in your town or you happen to be in the same town I live in. They all have meetings. Can I come into the meeting and give 20 minutes of my talk? They'll let you come in. Cool. And they'll tell you either you are good or you, you're not. Right. So you said a demo tape. Is that like, is that the, the most useful way to promote yourself or yeah. Yeah, the demo video in this day and age 
is the keys to the kingdom, are the keys to the kingdom. It uh, should be no longer than two or three minutes. You can make one that's 30 minutes long, but people are only going to watch it for a minute or two. You know, they have very short attention span. So you need to condense within that minute or two the elements that are going to get you hired. Right. And it should, you know, it should be dynamic. It should show you speaking in a number of venues, dressed in a number of different outfits, because if you have the same suit and the same tie, it's like, oh, that person just used green screen. Or right. now you can use green screen, but you could change your suit. You know, right. the first impression. You know, you have, never get a second chance to make a good first impression. So if you go to a speaker bureau, any of them, Google speaker bureaus, and go to them, the ones that are, have the ads are the ones that usually have the money. They'll have a list of speakers. And they'll say, pick a speaker or pick a topic or pick a price range. Go to the speakers that they're talking about. And let's say it says, you know, Anthony Gailey, put, put that name in Google. Go to their website and mm -hmm. see what their demo video is. And you'll see the people that are getting the 10, the 15, the $20,000, that there are some very common elements in their video and duplicate it. Gotcha. So, so, okay, so we've gotten the whole fear thing out of the way. We start to see ourselves being able to, to, to on these stages, talking to hundreds of people. And are these, like, when you do these trainings, are these, are these, like, I do, like, three, five, seven-day trainings. Yes. For, you know, but that's not, that's not how you work. That's not the corporate speaking biz, though. You, you, you get paid a lot of money for a really concentrated amount of time. Is, is that true or not true? <laughs> Like I said, I started out doing all day programs and right. I had the workbook, the materials, the sound system, the whole nine yards. And then when the bureau started booking me, we want you for 90 minutes or we want you for 60 minutes. And they would you know, fly me out there, take me, you know, all my expenses were paid. I do 60 minutes in front of 500,000, 2000 people sell 10 times more product that I was selling at my seminar. And I held on to the business for a while. Because I took me, you know, I built it from scratch and I loved it. And, and at one point it was like, this is dumb. Why am I doing these all day programs when I could be doing, you know, for 90 minutes? So that is what, you know, I shifted into doing nothing but the keynote or the um, platform presentations. You know, when, when you first told me that, my eyes about bugged out of my head. Because, you know, I, like I said, I do, I do long events. I do boot camps, right? And when you were telling me you were getting 10, 15, $20,000, for a 90 minute keynote. And I was like, that that's better than a lot of, you know, professional stage it just make for a, you know, a 90 minute or two hour. And I'm like, and I, I just was really, that's hard. First of all, first thing that popped into my head is how I condense my stuff down to 90 minutes. And I realized I would have to just start from scratch. There's obviously, you know, so obviously you don't have to be able to, to have 90, you know, three days of content to make, you know, to do this 90 minute keynote, you come in, you have a specific format that you follow, people get benefit from it, you collect your check, all expenses, and, and, you, and you just you're on to the next gig. I think that's amazingly cool, you know, um, because so much of like I said, I've been putting butts in seats since I was in my early 20s. You don't have to do any of that when you're a corporate speaker, you, you literally approach the the corporation like a almost like a one-on-one -on -one. is there a lot of hoops you got to jump through to like get into a corporation or or is there is there just like one person you talk to and that's it well i you know i can only speak to the way i did it <clears throat> and i i began by calling for example the local office for an insurance company and there, there's maybe eight uh, life insurance companies that are huge mm -hmm. probably 10 but i would go to one of the local offices go in do a good job, try to impress the office manager. What other office managers do you know? Well, they all have regional meetings. So the next shot was when the RVP, the regional vice president, well, we're having a meeting where we've got 20 offices attending. And then there'd be six or seven regions. And once you do the regional meetings, then they have the national and they have them throughout the year. Uh, home builders turned out to be a huge market. There are 650 home builders associations in the country. And uh, some of the smaller towns don't have any more than three or 400 people, but a city like Atlanta has 10,000 people mm -hmm. and they have meetings every month. And then they have one meeting every year, which they call the uh, parade of homes. And you could go to one of the local meetings, which are going to speak to about 500 to a thousand people. But if you get to that parade of homes, you're talking about three or 4,000 people and you speak at one home builder and they all know the other ones. They'll recommend you to another one, another one, another one. And then the, the NAHB, the National Association of Home Builders, is enormous. 
And the thing about home builders that was so good was when you're at a home builders meeting, they're not all home builders. At mm -hmm. least half, sometimes more than half, are the people that supply the home builders. And if you stop and think about it, <clears throat> that's a huge market. I mean, I ended up doing a bunch of seminars for DuPont because they make this Tyvek. That sent me into DuPont. Dorolast makes roofing. Uh, Sherwin-Williams makes paint. Uh, U.S. Filter makes filtration systems. All these spinoffs that were coming because I was speaking at these association meetings. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's 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 an unbelievably large pool of, wow. of businesses. All I can say is, wow. More yeah, I mean, if you think about what it takes. Off. <laughs> 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 And and companies I never heard of. Companies do things like like U.S. Filter. Mm -hmm. They make filtration systems for municipal um, companies for municipalities. These huge filtration systems that I never heard of. But they hired me five times to do programs. Who who knew there was right. such a company in U.S. Filter? So stuff like that. Amazing, amazing. I, I just it's it. I still have a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that almost nobody's doing this. You know. Um, it's, it's really exciting. So, all right. So obviously you, you run a program, you train people to do this. Right. And, and so again, playing devil's advocate, when people complete your program, yes. how successful, you know, what, what percentage of success do your, your students tend to get? And again, I realize that, you know, results are not typical and all that, but you know, what, what percentage of your students actually start making a living doing this and what separates the ones that are successful from the ones who aren't in your opinion. And in, in my opinion, first of all, I haven't trained that many, you know, mm -hmm. my, you were at my program. There's typically 15 people or 20 right. people. It's not, it's not 500 people, but I do follow-ups and uh, as best as I can gauge about 20% go out and start doing it. There's still 80% that I call. Are you doing it? Not yet. What do you mean? Well, I'm a stage hypnotist and I'm on this tour. And when I finish the tour in three months, then I'm going to begin the corporate speaking. Or, you know, something came up and I'm going to do it. I just haven't done it yet. It drives me up a wall. I have no explanation for it. Mm -hmm. When I was first doing the follow-ups, it was, well, I don't know what to say. When I So that's why I created the scripts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, okay. some people have just, you know, haven't gotten around to it. I think it's fear of making the first few calls. It's mm -hmm. fear of making the first. Mm -hmm. But the 20% that do it are like, just like you, can't believe I didn't do this before. Right. For sure. Like, you know, what, it, it, to, to speaking to that, when you talk about the facing the fear, one of the things that really impressed me when I was at your training was how you neutralized that fear. Because you literally got up on stage, grabbed a phone, and started calling real estate offices, <laughs> demonstrating <laughs> exactly what it sounds like and what it looks like. That, to me, was what was like, that, that puts you at like the Mount Olympus of trainers. Because one of the problems that we have as trainers and as, as, as speakers is that so many people go through these certification courses where they become certified in this and certified as a trainer in that. And then they get up on their stage and they talk about what happens in real life. You and, and very, but very few walk their talk. And you literally just grab, give me a phone, boom. And you just, you just did it right there. Mm -hmm. Right. And every, every mind in the place went, Oh, it's that easy. It is. You know? And I was like, and, and to me, if you had any fear or any doubt about how this worked, it, it, it was very, it was a very simple, very straightforward, but it was a real world application. You, you brought the real world into the training and showed people what that looked like. And as, as small a part of the training as that was compared to you know, the, the, the two, the full two days, because there's a lot that you go through. That to me was like uh, a Rubicon, so to speak. It's like, boom, this is reality. This is how it works. And if you just do this, you're going to be successful. You right? know, that happened totally by accident. Uh -huh. It was like the third or fourth program I did. I was explaining how to make calls and I could see the blank looks on people's faces. And it was just an impulse. I said, somebody pick a city. I think it was somebody picked Portland or something, whatever it was. Yeah. You know? So I went to the computer, Portland. I said, real estate offices. We did point at one of those numbers. And I picked up the phone and I showed them how to find out where the big offices were. And then what you say when you get to the big office, it's it's really not difficult. So you now, mind you. It took me a couple of years to figure out how to do that. Right. But once you know how to do it, it's 
So you've literally saved people years of trial and error and, and really streamlined it, but you've literally given them in your training. And I really appreciate all the materials. You know, I'm sure you'll talk about that, um, you know, towards the end of the year. Yeah. I really appreciate all the materials. Everything's laid out. Do this, say this, do this, say this, do this, say this. It's very simple. It's very easy to follow, right? I'm a big fan of, of uh, having, you know, a balance between roadmaps and just throwing your ass into the shit and making you swim, you know? Um, you're, you're really, you're, your system is really comprehensive. There's a lot of amazingly cool materials. So let's say that we decide to do this. Let's say we're, we're going go to we go through this training and now we're ready to, to hold out our shingle. What do you say is like one of the biggest benefits of being a corporate hypnotist or a corporate speaker? Well, I think most people would center on the money right away. Uh -huh. the, the, there's really an astounding amount of money. As, as you and I both know, there's someone that went through my course a couple of years ago who had never given a speech, public speech before, who is now commanding $27,500 per speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it happens, you know, it, it's, there are some, some people sitting there that are, that are gold mines that don't realize how good they are or how important their message is or how much their message would be positively responded to. You know, they keep it within themselves, so to speak, or they're sharing with their small coterie of clients they don't realize that if they, they get up and start broadcasting this to the world, that a lot of people might say, oh, that's that's just awesome. And um, so I think that's the biggest attraction. Right. I'll think, and it's, it's the most tangible. You know, right. when someone right. is, pays you a large amount of money to give a presentation, has assigned a physical value to it. But I just think it, uh, I love it. I just, as I say, often the comment is, I look like I'm having more fun up there than the people are. And I always am. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I was always intrigued by what hypnosis really was. Mm -hmm. So when I got to the hypnosis, I was always closely paying attention to the subjects because the whole uh, induction I use is designed to filter out who the really good subjects are. So when I bring them up there, they're really good subjects to begin with. And okay. that's what I get out of it. So, so I'm curious, um, it, it just as a ballpark, right? So you've been doing this 42 years. You've seen prices come up, prices come down. But people who are successful in this and the 20% that are successful, did we actually cover what they're doing, the, the difference that makes a difference for them? And, and not just that, what would be, the, what do you think the average income range for these 20% would be if you had to guess? Oh, goodness. Um, it's simple. Most of them these days are asking eight to 10,000 for a talk. Once you break through that 5,000 mark, it's easy to start asking more. Mm -hmm. So if you did a, you just, if you did one one talk a month, you, that'd be 120 an extra 120 k a year plus expenses, right? In your in, in your, your your bank account and helping to build your other aspects of your business. And I I would not presume to guess what their income is. I never ask. Right. I never ask what their income is. But as you say, if you do ten talks at eight thousand, right. you're doing eighty thousand dollars in business. It's as simple as that. Um, I. Some of them were wildly successful before they came. You know, right. some of them had, had real thriving businesses and a very good uh, sense of business. I have, I just know they're making a lot more money than they used to. That's good. And again, the reason I ask is because, again, I'm trying to put myself in the in the mindset of my viewers and my readers because they want to know what what can I really, you know, if I do this right now, um, what's what can I expect? You know, if I actually am one of those 20, you know, those those people who actually take the work and do it. One of the things I love about uh, the folks in Planet David is two things, really. Well, all right, three. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, um, they're they're some of the most action oriented people that I have ever encountered. They will take a technology and they will just go out and they will apply it uh, to their lives and they will measure the, 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 the validity of it and, and come back for more. Uh, the second thing is, is that they're very, they're very open. They're very passionate about what they do. And third, I think is that they're so open and accepting to people. I think these are people that have many of them have a, um, a very strong mission in this world, both on a personal level, but on an, an interpersonal level. I think they have a lot of messages that they want to get out into the world. And I think your program is an amazingly uh, great opportunity for them to take whatever level they're at and bring it up. But again, you have to think like a businessman. Okay, so if I invest the time, the energy to do this. What's the ROI that I can expect? Now, obviously, you only get out of it what you put into it. 
but you know, putting an extra 80 to 120,000 minimum into your, into your business. I mean, if you think, you know, whether you did one 10 K, you know, talk a month or two 5k talks a month, that's, that's not, that's not insignificant. That can significantly change a person's quality of living. And it can also be used to build your business and other aspects. So I think there's a, a tremendous, again, I, I, I just, when I, when I first started talking to you and I just, I just it was hard for me to wrap my head around the fact that almost nobody knows about this. You well, know, let so me give you the raw numbers. I, I, I sort of misunderstood your question before. <clears throat> if you talk to bureau reps, mm-hmm. and I got, I got to know a lot of them, their job is to just crank out numbers. They'll buy a list of companies and just go through. Do you have meetings? Bring in speakers. Well, it's absolute cold calling. It's the equivalent of bulk mailing. And they'll tell you that and if you're doing, if you're just starting out as a bureau rep, mm-hmm. that's why they want them all to make like 50 calls a day or something. It's four out of a thousand. I said, what do you mean? Four out of a thousand times you'll call somebody. I can't believe you called. We just were talking about we need a speaker or I can't believe you called. We just had a speaker that canceled. Thank God you called me for You could be the worst phone solicitor in the world. But if you make a thousand calls, you'll get four hits. That's the, the bottom line. Now, if you're skilled at what you're doing and, you know, and it's a directed call, it goes way up. But if you just bought a list and started making calls, it's four out of a thousand. So let's say you go to this course. And you've never made calls in your life that you're reading the script that's in the workbook, that you have no flair or style whatsoever. You're the worst speaker there ever was mm-hmm. because you know, I've seen people get booked that I think are the worst speaker I've ever seen, but they, you know, they still get booked and you started calling people. Now I know uh, from experience that these folks are not going to make 50 calls a day. They're not going to make 40 calls a day. They're not going to make 30 calls a day, but I ask, can you make 10 calls a day? What do you mean? If you make 10 completed calls a day, it's going to take you about a half hour to 45 minutes to get this business off the ground. If you want to keep your existing hypnotherapy business or your stage hypnosis business and just want to see if this works, would you be willing to make 10 calls a day to do it? Just read the darn script. I showed you how to find the clients. You know, If they'll do that, 10 calls a day, you take weekends, holidays out, you're talking roughly 2,500 calls in a year. If they get four out of a thousand, they've gotten 10 bookings in that year. If they're charging 8,000, it's 80,000. If they're charging 5,000, it's 50,000. But if you just want to get off the ground, now you may go out there and I don't like it. I'm, I've got stage fright or I don't like people looking at it. whatever. It happens. Right. But if you'll make 10 calls a day doing this for a year, numbers guarantee you'll get at least 10 talks at whatever the fee is that you're charging. You can be the world's worst speaker and have the world's worst technique and you'll make 50 grand if you'll make 10 calls a day. But once you get started, you don't have to make 10. I I point out, you're not going to be cold calling for long. Right. You go to one of these groups, they're almost all connected to others. Then it becomes asking for referrals. You know, did you like what I did? Oh, I thought it was great. Can you recommend three or four other people? Now you're not making cold calls anymore. You're making warm calls. And then when you've got your demo video and all that, now you're making a hot call. You know, I'm here because so-and-so gave me your name. Give them a call if you want to see if it's good or not. So you're not, I mean, if you, the, the absolute out in the wilderness doing what I did. Thank you so much for shortening the curve. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it's it's 10 calls a day. Excuse me. Yeah, 10 calls a day will get you 10 bookings in a year if you are the world's worst speaker. But of course, by the time people come to my program, number one, most of them are skilled hypnotists. It's it's why I don't teach them how to hypnotize. Right. Somebody early on said, you know, don't even try to teach. They all think they're the world's greatest hypnotist anyhow. <laughs> You're wasting your time, you know, and they do. You know, They've all got their own style and their own rhythm and all that. So I, I don't. It's crazy. We joke about it. It's a it's a co- group of corporate hypnotists, but I'm not really teaching them hypnosis. I'll teach them my induction, right? Which is, but not you know, they know how to hypnotize. What they all they need to know is how do I package this to get corporations to hire me? What do I say? Who do I call? How do I handle it? What should I be asking? You know, how do I put together the demo video? How sh- what should my website look like? It's not complicated or difficult. Mm-hmm. And if you ask me, what do people get out of that course more than anything? I think more than anything, what they get out of it is how not to do it. In other words, I explain the mistakes that most right. people make. The mistakes that I made, tried this, blew up in my face. Don't do this. This is what works. What you know, would you say are the top three mistakes that people, you know, 
maybe do they introduce themselves as a hypnotist. It's probably oh. the biggest mistake they make right off the bat. Right on. You know? I'm Anthony Gailey. I'm a corporate hypnotist. We'll shut down 40% of the people you talk to. The hypnotist. Uh, I saw. We were on a cruise last year. I know what that is. No, no, no. Mm, okay. <laughs> not interested. Right on. So I'm, I'm not Anthony Gailey hypnotist. I'm Anthony Gailey corporate keynote speaker. I'm Anthony Gailey platform presenter. I'm Anthony Gailey trainer, you know, who does a program that, that happens to have this hypnosis demonstration in it. Yeah. You mentioned something about, um, your special hypnosis induction what's what's that about teasing us mr gailey is that what's going on here no it was by necessity you mentioned that the presentations can be 90 minutes some of them are 60 minutes mm -hmm. the first really 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 big presentation i had was in a group called mdrt million dollar round table for the first time they invited me and it was five thousand people and they told me i had 55 minutes I was doing an induction that was 20 to 25 minutes long. Your standard, bring a bunch of people up on the stage, throw back the ones you don't need and all. And I realized that that was eating up half my time, you know, more than half my time doing that. And I would have no time left to do what I was supposed to be doing was imparting a serious business message. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> cause once you do the induction, you still have to do hypnosis and then you have to connect it to a business message. And one day it just occurred to me that, the, the way out of it was do some suggestibility tests, identify who the good subjects are, bring up the ones you should bring up in the first place. Mm -hmm. Just forget all the sing-songy, count back from 10 to 1, music playing in the background, mm -hmm. time-consuming stuff. And in a group of 1,000 people, you could conceivably bring up 100 people. and You could fill the stage. All that takes time. Everybody right. you bring up takes at least a few minutes just to say hi. I, so right. I, I topped it off at eight people. I started out at 12 and then brought it down to eight. It was all time saving because if you are doing professional talks, they often expect you to hold, it's very professional to hold to your time. Mm -hmm. If they say 90 minutes, they don't mean 110 minutes. If they say 60 minutes, they don't mean 75 minutes. And sometimes, you you know, on the stage, if you have a great group of subjects or an audience that's really enthusiastic, very, very easy to get all wrapped up in it. And you get this standing ovation. You think you did a great job. And the person running the meeting comes up and sort of chides you. Thanks a lot. We got 500 cold lunches now, thanks to you. Or mm. like you took someone else's time. Right. For, so the whole induction was, how can I get some really good, high-quality subjects up here? And I've got it down to 11 minutes. So that's why when they see the YouTube videos, when I walk up and snap my fingers or just point – they've kind of been pre-selected in a sort of a interesting way. You mm -hmm. know, just a couple of suggestibility tests. I go out in the audience, identify the ones that I think are good subjects, bring them up. They, they've kind of been primed. But there's Is no there, formal induction per se. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, again, so you've taken a 25 minute process for that most people would have to go through to get the best subjects, or at least up on stage and shorten it down to around an 11 minute, 11 minute segment, yeah. um, with the highest probability of being successful. So I think that's, that's awesome. Um, is there like a checklist that they go through when, when you do that? Again, I, obviously we don't have time to, for you to do the induction. We don't have an audience except me and I don't want to cook like a chicken. So, um, but I mean, is that part of the, part of what they get when they, when they, when they, they come through? Oh, your domain? Yeah. You know, they get exactly how to do it. And it's uh, the, the checklist, so to speak, <clears throat> is when you're doing the suggestibility test, when a person does enter a trance-like state, there are what's called it cluster of symptoms mm -hmm. you want to be looking for the slow regular breathing the absence of motion catalepsy you want to see the ironed out facial expression they're not going to be gritting their teeth shifting around playing with something you see the catalepsy the absence of motion the ironed out facial expression the slow regular breathing and then the way i do it is i come up and i'll touch them on the shoulder and that tells me everything i need to know okay. because if they're really good subjects they're, they you know, we call them floppers sometimes you know they'll, they'll almost collapse into the chair if the person is uh, better than average or even a good subject, there'll still be some tension, some pullback. And I just don't bring them up. I go very carefully. And when I find the ones I'm looking for, I bring them up. So 99% of the time, I've identified someone at the tail end of the continuum, one of the top you know, three or 4%. You don't need a formal induction. You don't need big, long, you know, count yeah. back from 10 with music playing. 
those people live in hypnosis pretty much. That's fantastic. That is that 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 is a solid gold radioactive nugget for anybody doing hypnosis anyway. So I'm curious, sir, you've got a training coming up. Was it February or March? February in a month, February. almost a month from today. Yeah. Okay. So I'm so obviously this is something that I I highly recommend people who want to be speakers and who want to be well paid and reach a lot of people and build your your coaching or hypnotherapy or NLP practice. How um, I'm curious. First of all, how can uh, you know what are you, what are they getting when they sign up for your when they sign up for your training? What are what are what, what are the goodies? What are the, the what's the meat? Two day program. Uh, each day different than the other. First day is all about building the talk. You know how do I? What are you going to talk about? How do you brand it? What's your hook? Catchy name for it? How do you build the talk itself? How do you step by step put together a talk? I call it a one two three process. How do you do the induction that I do? You know how do you slide into talking about hypnosis? How do you do the induction? How do you connect the hypnosis induction to what you were talking about earlier, making it a business message? How to wrap it up? Sell product at the end. If you're doing coaching, how to get coaching clients from it? How to get referrals from it, etc. Day number one, essentially, how do you do the public talk? Day number two, now you have this public talk, how do you market it? Who do you market it to? Who do you call? What do you say? How do you put your website together? How do you build that all important to a three minute long video? What are the elements it should contain? How do you package that, et cetera? So day number two is all about how to sell it. And then also give everybody a flash drive. And on the flash drive, I believe it's up to like 20 gigs worth of material. I give them all the stuff I used to sell all so that they can transcribe it if they want, use material out of it, get all the information that I used to share with groups. It gives them, I guess, close to 100 books about hypnosis on PDF. There are various videos there. If you look at the YouTube, I cut the induction out of the video because you don't want people getting hypnotized watching the video. But <clears throat> the videos I give them are uncut. They can see exactly how I transition from talking about it on stage to going out and identifying the good subjects and then bringing them up and doing the induction. A uh, variety of other things. The the uh, flash drive is chock full of material. All kinds of books about speaking, public speaking from other sources, etc. So. Yeah, and maybe what we can do is in the in the comment section or at the tail end of this video, you give me a list of all the things that they get. Um, Everything byproduct of this training. It's um, loaded. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know I'm still going through <laughs> half the stuff that I got when I trained with you, and I really I, I did get quite a bit from from you. I've been doing speaking for years, and I still came away with a tremendous amount of head slapping moments, you know? Um, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I've been, I was, you know, I knew about you for several years, but I always kind of sat back and wondered, I, I don't know. Is this, is this, is this something I should think about? Should I do this? And then one day I just, I just looked at it and that voice in my head said, this is for you, you know? And I was like, pick up the phone, signed up for the class. And it was some of the best investments I ever made in myself and in my business. So that, the, that was the subliminal messaging in all those YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. anyway, it shows how good a hypnotist you truly are. I, I knew a guy who sold subliminal tapes. Uh -huh. This goes back like to the 90s. And I asked him one day, I said, what, what do you put on the subliminal tapes? He says, buy more tapes, buy more tapes. <laughs> <laughs> what else would I put on them? He says, <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. Um, so I'm curious, like, um, what's um, what's the investment, and is there any any benefit for folks who want to get in, like, right now? Is there anything that? If you get in right now, within the next couple of weeks, it's five thousand dollars, but there's a five hundred dollar discount. I think I believe that goes away the fifteenth of the month. It goes away in okay, so you only have until the fifteenth of January. Of January, yes, and uh, okay. then it's forty five hundred. Then it goes up to five thousand. You can pay that in installments if you need to. And as I mentioned, when you get there, you'll get a workbook, you get the flash drive with all the materials. I hand out some goodies like some mm -hmm. pendulum, and I show you a flashlight induction. It's really kind of cool. Most people don't know about it. They get. Uh, did you ever try the flashlight induction, David? No, I, I can't say I have. No, you got you got to do it. It's, it's it really does work. It freaked me out the first ten times I did it. It was uh, kind of remarkable. But those that's like ancillary. But you get that kind of stuff, goodies like that. So, Excellent. so um, what else do you think folks need to know? What else do you want to, for those of you who are maybe on the fence about whether this is something for them, whether it's something that can add significant leverage to their life? On, on so many different levels, financially, in terms of the audience they reach, building their business. I'm curious, what other things, you know, should they know about, okay. about being a corporate speaker? Uh, I'm sure you'll provide them with a link to the website. Mm -hmm. Go to the website. One of the columns is uh, 
one of the tabs is testimonials. Right. They're going to recognize some of the testimonials. You're in there. Richard Nongard's in there. A lot, a lot of really well-known hypnotists, hypnotherapists are in there. Look at what they said at the testimonial. If you know them well enough, pick up a phone, call them, ask them, do you think this is something that's worthwhile, something I should do? Uh, it's up there now where there's at least 25 or 30 very well-known hypnotists and hypnotherapists that have done it. And I believe will speak very highly of it. And I don't know. I mean, I can tell you how good it is, but I'm biased. <laughs> so. And I say that exact same thing to, to, to my people. I say, you guys expect me to tell you my stuff's the greatest thing since sliced bread. What are the people who've been through the program say? And I'll be honest. Um, I, you know, I was surprised by when I was in the class, the, some of the heavy hitters that were there, like you, one of your guys is like the top hypnotist, corporate hypnotist in Canada. And then you got a guy who's like, who's a uh, super duper in as a Brazil. Rafael Beltresca, the, yeah. the most successful and best known hypnotist in all of Brazil. Right? Yeah. And then of course we Started all know from zero. We all know the incomparable Chase Hughes, right? Chase is awesome. <laughs> Chase is awesome. Yeah. You know, um, so you've had some, you've had some pretty high people, high level people in your chair who've gone out to do tremendous, tremendous things with the information that you've got. So I, I, again, I, I can't speak highly enough of it. Uh, Thank for those you. of you who want to uh, learn more, where can they reach? I'm, I'm going to give them a link, you know, go to www.davidsnydernlp.com forward slash hypno speaker, H Y P N O S P E A K E R. David Snyder, NLP.com forward slash hypno speaker that will forward you to um, Mr. Gailey's website. Um, yes. But if they wanted to talk to you like in person or they had questions, where, where can they, where can they reach you? 800-462-5748 is my 800 number. Goals for you at MSN.com. G O A L S number four letter U at MSN.com. Okay. The old MSN.com. The old MSN. You're like me. I still got my Yahoo account. I've been, I'm older than dirt. <laughs> anyway. <Get in> there. <laughs> Anthony, thank you so much for, for spending time with us and really kind of shedding some light on a very, very, you know, little known area where hypnotists, neurolinguistic programmers, coaches, and, and other forms of, of uh, helpers. I guess is a good way to say it, can really make some tremendous inroads. I'm, I'm grateful for the work that you've done. Thank you for pioneering uh, this program for us. For making all the mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> for doing that. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you very much, David. See you soon. <laughs>